Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. Today on the show, I have Stina Ehrensvard, the founder and CEO of the Yubico company that developed the YubiKey back in 2007. Not only that, but she and her husband also co-authored the standard for two-factor authentication that the world uses today, along with Google. We talked about what the last 12 years look like, how crypto and Bitcoin changed the security game back in 2011. We went through some crazy stuff. And I'm Charlie Sherman. I'll talk to you guys right in a minute. Well, where are you now? So you just flew back from Switzerland? Uh, Sweden, you said. Sorry. I flew back from Sweden. Um, where are you? I was born in the U.S. by Swedish parents, and then I grew up in Sweden. And Ubico was actually founded in Sweden. Yes. And uh, we have some cool history. Uh, this, the you know, well, my my husband and the co-founder, uh, his grand 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 grandfather, ten generations back, built uh, a fortress to protect the Sweden against foreign attacks. And he was noble by the Swedish king because he was the most innovative security technology at the time. So that's our Swedish history. <laughs> In well, 2011, what's... we moved to California to continue our mission, you know, protecting people. And, you know, but now it's not protecting a country with, you know, with a fortress and and cannons and walls, but actually, um, you know, cybersecurity. That's our mission today. For those who don't know, I have Stina here, who's the founder and CEO of YubiKey, uh, Yubico, actually. YubiKey is just one of their products. Sorry, I've been using YubiKey for so long. um, I didn't even realize there was a company like I thought YubiKey was the company. The YubiKey has become like a, like a product, like scotch tape, like one of those products that you just always use. And so, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, you have, you have a, like, like tape, I don't know. Um, like, uh, like tape to, to tape something up, whatever, like masking tape or whatever. Right. So there's a company called scotch tape that makes that, that makes that's been making it for so long that now people don't call it tape. They call all brands Scotch tape, but Scotch tape is a specific brand of it. You know what I mean? Thank you. That is a compliment. Yes, we, I mean, I think there is a reason for it. We are the inventor (laughs) behind what the industry term security keys. We were the driver behind the standards that have been implemented by, by all the leading platforms and browsers. We are the core inventor behind it and we were also the first reference design so but in I 2007 think there is a reason <laughs> in 2007 <laughs> people weren't really like looking for two factor authentication i mean you had to co-author the standard why did you start the company I, like was was w- w- was hacking and phishing attempts uh, an issue at the time did someone come to you or did you build this f- for you did you need this product yes i did <laughs> Tell me. I mean, there is a, a story. I, it's not an untold story, but I'm going to tell it anyway, because it is hilarious. Uh, this is before we started Ubico. Uh, my bank uh, in Sweden, I lived in Sweden at the time. Uh, they told me that I would be safe with a username and a password and a software application I downloaded on my computer. And uh, I told my husband, Jacob, who is a former White Hat hacker and a security expert, and, and, I, and I asked him, is this, am I, am I supposed to be secure with this? And he said, it would take him one day to write the code that would yeah. empty my bank account. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm very sort of like, I don't take these kind of information on, you know, without any action. So I called up the, the customer service at the bank and I said, I have a friend I didn't say he was the father of my three mm. children. I, said, I have a friend uh, who says he can empty my bank account in a day. What are they going to do about that? And they responded, please tell your friend not to do that. Wow. That please is tell funny. your friend not to do that. <laughs> so that's so, how this company was started. That's the reason why we started. Yes, I so had to protect sitting, my own si- bank account. You're sitting at, this, at your desk and this is going on and you're saying to, us, to yourself, okay, there needs to be a better way to to log in to anything because did you did you realize that that authentication between people to the computers so that's what really that's kind of like the big picture here you you and your husband realized very early on that there eventually will be a need for authenticating a physical person with a digital identity yes and that's what you that bridge is what you've invented created and co-authored and with Google. And what I need, what I really want to understand 
is how did you see that vision so forward? But I guess you kind of answered in your in your in your story in your story when you first started the show of of the fortress and the castle. So it's kind of like in your in your DNA. It's in your it's in your blood, right, to protect people. I mean, I I mean, I, I told about Sweden because I just landed and I'm a little jet lag still. Uh, yes, Sweden uh, is you know we Sweden is a country that has. Uh, put out a few other standards. We actually put out the standard for the three-point seatbelt too. Uh, and I was inspired when I heard the story about the three-point seatbelt. It was designed- What's the story? Years. It was 60 years ago when the cars and the, uh, you know, the, the highways were just getting out there before, you know, people went, you know, with a horse or whatever they traveled with. <laughs> and this was the, the shift for the society at the time. It was the new communication transportation method. It revolutioned uh, the car getting into the size, the revolution in some way, not as much as the internet has, but it did 60 years ago. And it was not designed for security, just like the internet. The internet was designed, is it 30 years ago now? I can't yeah. Remember, you know? I saw- yeah no. <laughs> and you know, the guys, the brilliant minds behind the internet, they never thought the internet would be designed the way, you know, used the way it is today. It was designed for sharing. And so going back to the seatbelt, the cars were not designed for security either. They were, you know, people put them up and then people drove faster and faster. And then things, you know, it actually, they're there today. There are 10 times more cars on the streets, but less fatal accidents because people realized and the, the, the number one guy who mentioned was actually a Swedish inventor yeah. at Volvo in the Swedish car manufacturer. He said, hey, we need a seatbelt for a car and it has to be super easy. It has to work with one hand. It has to be, um, you know, ordinary people don't want to be uncomfortable even for a minute. So with that objective, he invented the three-point seatbelt and then he did something brave. He went up to the, the board of Volvo and said, this has to be an open standard. We have to give this to the world. It cannot just be in Volvo cars. It has to be everywhere because this affects all cars and Volvo can you know, become a leader in safe cars. <laughs> and they did, you know, even though they're a small car manufacturer, if you think about Volvo as a brand, they are you know, associated with safe Volvo cars. Volvo is known as that car brand that you can see a Volvo on the street and it's gonna start. Like, there's no question. There was a famous joke. There was like a, a zombie apocalypse. The Volvo should make this like a commercial. And all the cars, you know, were all broken as the zombies. But the Volvo still starts. It's still ready to go. Yeah. Anyway, so that those are my two inspirations. The bank that, that said they, I should tell my my security expert friend that he shouldn't hack my account <laughs> because that was the only answer they had to, to that problem. And then, you know, reading about how fantastic impact uh, the, the inventor of the seatbelt had, not just by like, this is a problem. We have to identify a problem. It's not just a Volvo problem. It's a global, it's a society problem with cars on the street and people are dying. And, you know, what, do we need to do? We need to make it simple. We need to make it a standard. And eventually, I mean, if we, the reason why seatbelts are so effective today is not only because they're easy to use and it is a standard, but actually the governments around the world have realized the problem and put in regulations and, and requirements for it. And I'm seeing the internet secu- safety and security going exactly the same direction. And I was inspired to be part of that journey. That's why we started Ubico. Right? And when, when people said a few years ago, Stina, why are you building this company? Why are you giving away most of the things you build, the open standards and open source? And I said, well, because it, it is important. You know, we are, um, we are fueled by that mission to help protect the internet for billions of people. And we believe we can build a successful company in parallel. And I am very fortunate and grateful and humble to... Um, to be able to say, yes, we have been able to do both. So is- how does the YubiKey work? <laughs> how does, because the product, ha, like, although it's gone through so many iterations, it, the, the fundamental of the product has not changed since you've invented it. Why is it so important? And why is this product something that, 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 that even today, like you're seeing a resurgence of SIM card jacking where people cell phones with SMS two-factor authentication. Uh, SMS two-factor. So first of all, before you talk, I just want to say, guys, whoever's listening, if you are doing any account using two-factor authentication through your cell phone SMS, listen, you will get hacked. 
It's not an if. You will get hacked. Stop using SMS two-factor authentication. Stop it. Okay, now it's your turn. I apologize. People don't okay, listen, so I, and they keep I, getting I their, 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 their cell phones attacked. Yes. So this is the challenge that Jacob knew about. This is, you know, we started the company 13 years ago. We are, you know, the first seven years was a slow ride and now it's it's really starting to take off. But um, anything you download on your computer or a phone is vulnerable for attacks. And SMS is is vulnerable for the social engineering and phishing in a way that is even more than the apps that you put on a phone or the software certificate you put on a computer that my bank has provided me these 13 yeah. years ago. I don't even know what that, yeah. what the software so certificates. Yeah. The, the solutions that were available at the time, and I think I just want to sort of share the problem we tried to solve uh, at the time that was good enough. I actually is still, I wouldn't say the best, but because... Security keys and the FIDO web auth and standard is even more secure, but it is traditional smart cards. Smart cards using public key crypto, that, but they need a reader, they need a client software, they need a driver. They're, they, the whole complexity, the, the, there's a certificate authority, that everything that you want to, if you want to deploy smart cards, yeah. it comes with a lot of pain. <laughs> And the government here in the U.S. and governments around the world are using smart cards, but many of them actually have their cards on the shelf because they're so complex to deploy. So Jacob and I were thinking, hmm, how do you how do you take the security and the good thing of in smart cards, but just simplify it? And uh, in order to make that happen, we had to work with Google and the leading browsers and platforms to get native support in in the browser, because then you don't need any client software and a driver. But I'm just going to show you here. You've got the video. This is a UBT. Beautiful. I got it on my keychain. I can put it in my computer, or I can tap it on my phone, just like with NSC here in the back. And it works both with iPhones and Android phones. And it also comes with a USB-C port, so you can plug it into a USB-C computer. And when you plug it into a computer, the service that you want to log into that we want to protect has to make support. So it doesn't like work for every bank and everything on the planet right now, but with a standard, it eventually will. Uh, then you combine it with a simple pin or a simple password. The security is no longer in the password. It's no longer in the pin. And then you just touch it. And, and here's a little gold area. And when I touch this gold area, I verify that I'm a real human behind the computer I'm not a Trojan. I'm not a, a hacker sitting in another room, in another country, in another wherever. I am by my computer. I'm the legitimate user behind this device. And together with Google, we created something other super cool. It's the region bound keys is that when you register this for a site with uh, for Google or Facebook or Microsoft and all the cool companies who've made support for this, it, you, this, the URL that is initiated with the, the first time you register this, it has to be the same account every time you log in. You cannot be tricked to go into a fake website. That is the number one problem with, with SMS, with any apps there. It, it's so difficult to actually know if you're tri tricked or the wrong website. The yeah, middle, really man in the middle that. attacks, just all these different, there's so many. Yeah, including the other mobile apps, the one-time password apps that are very popular and they are better. They're much better than SMS. I think you were very good to say, SMS, please don't use that. The The other authentication well, apps are have this vulnerability, but not at the same scale. Yeah, so my whole point is that you know, if you want to create your own username and password, that's fine. Um, but then when you use your your phone as your SMS two factor, what happens is, is you allow a hacker to go to your cell phone service company, which is so easy to do and so cheap. You can it's so easy uh, and then get your phone number and then basically reset every password, every everything you've ever owned based on SMS. It sounds scary, right? A device like a YubiKey, which you can have multiple, you can have backups of the YubiKey. Not only, and this is what's really cool, Stina, not only did it provide like a source of like doing double authentication, but it's like human authentication because of the finger. Your finger has to touch that gold piece. So I don't know if I told you this, when I first got my device, I thought it was broken. So I first got my first YubiKey, it was 2012. And um, I, I couldn't, I didn't know that you have to put your finger and then it, and then it, it gen generates the, the OTP, the one-time password. 
And I was like pushing it. I was like, why is the button not pushing in? I couldn't figure it out. And then I checked Google and I, I was just doing it the wrong way. It was pretty funny. Yeah. So the first, I mean, you did say, mention something important. The first device that we put out in 2008 was um, the one-time password feature. The key looks exactly the same. The user experience is the same, but that initial the protocol was just a one-time password and it's good security, but it's not the ultimate user experience security as we have with the FIDO web and standards. But it's sort of, it was the, you know, the start of, of what we're doing so today. With, with the FIDO web authentication standards, it's not just authenticating the middle person, but you're, you, what type of requirements or what type of standards does a service have to have? For example, if, if I'm a coffee shop and I want anyone to log in you know, to my coffee shop uh, to buy a coffee, they have to use a YubiKey, right? Let's just say what what type of standards or, or requirements are needed on my end as a coffee shop website to to provide to prevent a hacker from coming in and then being able to man in the middle attack and then someone being able to like blame YubiKey. So you probably require certain things, certain standards. What are those things? We provide free open source uh, code um, servers uh, that any company can implement. And um, the first spec we put out together with Google is called FIDO U2F. There is now a FIDO Web Authn. The FIDO U2F was, it actually could be done within a couple of days. We know a big cloud services said they put an intro <laughs> and they, they implemented yeah. it in two days. The Web Authn is a slightly more, you know, probably a, you know, a week or so, maybe even more depending on your, you know, what skills you have in house, but that's the that's how this coffee shop or any service provider or any you know cloud uh, company or software company that's available for free. And then the user comes with a security key. In our case, it is we call it the UV key. And and thank you for highlighting that our brand is in some case synonymous with a security key. But the, the industry stand, standard is a FIDO security key. Um, and, um, it's so interesting that you've almost like welcomed competition. Yes, <laughs> because but the market is so big and it is, it's a huge market. Us. So we just said, Hey, there's going to, we can be a small fish in a small pond or big fish in a small pond, or we can be, uh, you know, a nice fish, a bigger fish in an enormous pond, the globe, the 4 billion, the six, I don't know, 4 billion people. But it wasn't back then. <laughs> back then, this was not, that there was no industry, very similar to Bitcoin and crypto. And, and that industry, nowadays, you can Google YubiKey. If you go to news.google.com and you type in YubiKey, you'll see, uh, you know, you, Google adopts a standard. Apple now has support for YubiKey. It's like, these are all these companies. It's like, you are the leader in that security, but the, the business model was completely different. So what advice would you give to Bitcoin or crypto entrepreneurs who, who, cause I know you give a lot of talks to entrepreneurs who are struggling with this. Should I, you know, work together with my competitors to grow this small pie that we're still in now, or do I compete with them in a very hostile way, which some crypto companies do too, in order to fight over the market share that's there now. I during my years as an entrepreneur, I've got so many advice, and some of them have been brilliant, and some of them, I, I actually, if I had Stupid. followed them, I would not have been here. <laughs> it's <laughs> you know, contrary, you, know, you do the opposite. So I can't give a simple answer. I just you, you, the the best answer I have to any entrepreneur is just like, who, why did you start your company? What's your gut feeling? You know, what's the core vision? What do you want out of it? And Th th we wanted to drive this. We wanted to be part of this standard. And, you know, that was the, you know, the nurture for starting this company. So for me, there wasn't another choice. Uh, if you ask a lot of other successful companies on the planet, they have taken another approach. They have been the one competing and building, you know, becoming the monopoly. And they've done it super successful. So there isn't like a cookie cutter for entrepreneurs, go a standard yeah. way. But if you're passionate about standards and you, and you figure out the formula, you need to hire good standards people because it's a politics and, you know, a lot of patience to get those things done. And this was our strategy. Just, you know, if anyone want to do a standard, I have, I have a couple of advice, <laughs> you know, the, first you have to identify who are the thought leaders in that standard space that okay, you need to influence. And we identified five companies. 
<laughs> we need to get Google and Microsoft and Facebook and Apple and Amazon. If we can win those five, you know, not just winning them by pushing, but, you know, becoming their friends, understand their needs, working with them, work, you know, develop and, and solve their needs, um, then we can win the world. We don't have to get all the governments or all the banks or all the, you know, because that's sort of the strategy. It was a very, very focused business plan. We came to Silicon Valley. We were a 10 man company. We're basic. We were not really profitable. No one wanted to invest in my company at the time because we were hardware and open source and open standards. And that's not the All I hear is overhead, no business model, no money. (laughs) As an investor, it's all I hear. You know, the formula for Silicon Valley is software and, yeah. and uh, Close you know, source, yeah. yeah, recurring revenue. And I was like, I didn't fit into that mold. So a lot of yeah, people said, revenue, yeah. actually came. And, and when I approached investors, they said, they, you, you, I mean, congrats on your success, but you're not going to be that unicorn we would like to invest in. You know, you're going to be a nice company. Okay, come on. This is so cool. This is the new BitPay card that I have in my hand. And I'm so excited to be finally having the new one that just came out. Now, guys, I've been using the BitPay card since 2016. Yeah, you heard that right. Way before I started Untold Stories, way before BitPay became a sponsor of mine, I've been using this card and it literally became a way for me to have a bank account uh, for many, many years as, as a lot of people in crypto need banking, need better banking. The BitPay card is chock full of the coolest features. It's got contactless pay, uh, better rates and limits, no fees to convert from Bitcoin right onto the card, added in chip security. I mean, it's sexy. It looks good. Unlike other cards, it's so easy to get. Just download the BitPay app on your phone, click the card icon, and you can do it right there. If you use the promo code CHARLIEJUNE20, your card is free. Remember, CHARLIEJUNE20. 20. It's in the show notes. You can get a free card. So literally just from listening to my show today and make sure you actually listen, you could get a free card just by entering that code. So download the BitPay app, get the coolest card on the market, the best card on the market. I've been using it for over four years now. I know there are so many cards out there, but the BitPay brand is the oldest and longest running Bitcoin company in the world. I mean, that's who issues this card. This is the card you want to have. Remember, Charlie, June 20, download the BitPay app on iOS or Android to sign up for the new card. You're going to freaking love it. And it wasn't actually until a couple of years ago that we were seeing the big Silicon Valley investors really starting to paying attention. And it wasn't because I approached them, because at the time I already given up approaching them. I'm like, OK, they, they you know. I'm going to just build my company. And we got some really nice business angels on board. So I did get some Silicon Valley. Uh, there, there are some very influential angels, uh, uh, including Mark Benioff, who sits in Salesforce, and Mark and Ram Sharam, who sits in the in Google board, and Andy Bestoshan, who is a hardware is engineer who started Sun Microsystems and invested in Google. And, you know, so I, I, I got the influencers in Silicon Valley, but I didn't, I wasn't able to win the big VCs. Uh, anyway, we continued to grow. And then I got approached by bigger VCs when they heard about us from CISOs, you know, security uh, professionals at big companies, not only in Silicon Valley, but beyond, who they had approached and said, what, what, what are you implementing? What has been effective? Why, you know, what kind of security technology do you, are you in the process of deploying? And, and I think it was, there was, there was a guy who asked 20 CISO, but 18 of them referred to UV keys uh, or oh, our wow. other product, the HSM, that's also now a secure cryptocurrency, by the way. It's a so hardware. Talk about that. Yeah. It's a hard, it's a little hard. It's called hardware security model. I don't have, I would love to show you it. it okay. It looks like the YubiKey, but it's just this part. It, it's the same design as a YubiKey Nano. Do you know the YubiKey Nano? It's a little, yeah, it's just this USB part. And it is to protect secret that sits on the server. It's the same hardware, but a completely different software. And it's a much more. How does that work though? How, so, so. It's more so for essentially if you keep a private key on a server, this is, yes. this is what, what, how, how does that work? I mean, it's more of a physical protection of a server. Someone comes into the data room and steals the server. This is a way to encrypt the sensitive data that sits on a server. So it's not, it's not the, you know, you, you use a YubiKey yeah. to log into a service. And this is for protecting 
the servers. And and the hardware security models are out there. Banks, um, wait, so different can, companies. Those are the, the data, ones. Who, yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm trying to understand how this works. So, can the data on the server interface with the rest of the world while it's encrypted? Uh, so it is. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> I, I'm i not the right person to answer exactly okay. how it works because I'm not well, technically well, What I'm trying enough. to get at is if, if, if I'm like a Bitcoin exchange and I keep one private key on the server, I want to encrypt the whole server and I keep it in a necklace, can, can the exchange still run like 24-7? Can people still use it but the data is all encrypted on the server or it needs to be like unlocked for everything so to work? That's meeting- what Cryptocurrency companies are using our HSM to protect oh, wow. servers. That's so cool. Um, and ex- I, I, I must admit, I'm not the technical expert of Ubico. I can talk about technical on a high level and HSM, exactly how it works. Uh, I'm not the expert to go into that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's really it's really cool. I'm I'm understanding how it works and, and its concept and ideas. Um, so it started it's... actually what, when we, we were dependent on the one-time password YubiKey. This is actually how how do we invent things? <laughs> we 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 had to buy uh, HSM. It's called hardware security models, and they're between ten twenty thousand dollars each. We had to go, uh, uh, and at the time, this is ten years ago. We were a tiny company with no real funding, and we could not. And we had five um, because we wanted it to be redundant. So we had these five servers across the globe, and we could not afford to buy. You know. That would be hundred thousand dollars plus recurring support costs. So we, we Jacob, uh, the brilliant um, inventor behind a lot of what we have done in Ubico, he just said, "I, I will. We will buy build our own HSM." So we took the same hardware and we we put in some you know some different backend software, and it's not as advanced as the HSMs that are on the market uh, that are twenty thousand dollars, but it's far better than a TPM. Um, or there, there are other ways to secri- encrypt and secure servers today. That is, and we are somewhere between, you know, the, the yeah, basic Yeah, you're like things. a good retail product for that. Yes, That's so, exactly. I'm going to buy one and check it out. Um, uh, it's $650 retail. So it's a more expensive than a YubiKey, but it, it compared to $10,000, $20,000, it's, it's affordable. How has the security landscape changed from like 2008 to, or 2010 to 2020? Like what? Uh, it's, everything has gone to the cloud. <laughs> We're sitting here. The world is completely dependent on the internet today, more now more than ever in this remote workforce. And so that is a big change. A lot of, you know, 2011 was much more on-prem. Uh, we are also seeing much more built-in security. When you go and get servers from Microsoft or from Google or from Amazon, a lot in, in AWS or G Suite or Azure, it's built-in security. Before you had to go and get, you know, a virus protection somewhere, an encryption tool somewhere, you know, and, and now a lot of it is, it's, it, I mean, unfortunately, because they are very powerful and they're going to continue to be very powerful. These large cloud companies are building in security. You don't really have to think about it uh, the same way that you had to think about it before. And they are doing a very good job, a very good job. The piece that we are providing is that authentication key uh, that you know, actually the FIDO web auth and standards will eventually be built in, and it, it is already starting to be built into computer and phones. So Google has a Chromebook, for example, that has an inbuilt you know FIDO key in it. Um, but it's always going to be better security if it's not tied to a multi-purpose computer or phone. It's always going to be better security if it's not tied to an internet, and it, you, it, you minimize the tech vector to something that is just a little key <laughs> and it's just done for one simple you know purpose it's not done for, for you know all the other things a computer and phone is is used for so the, the answer to your question yes everything is going to the cloud things are being built in standards are evolving because everyone have realized this is a problem when we were approached by google in 2010 they actually became our customers they had a year earlier been hacked by an organization that had ties to a country, uh, to China. And they it's called Aurora. So it's, I can be in public about this. It's on, you can find it on in Wikipedia. And you're not only users, but also um, IP had been a compromised. And Sergey Brin stepped up and said, this cannot happen. This is going to be, 
you know, devastating for our brand and our reputation, our future, if we don't step up our security. So they started investing in in good security. And at the time, they were actually considering smart cards because that was the best at the time. And we had that, you know, when, it, what do you call it? It's a divine intervention <laughs> where they had started buying our OTP product and we knew that that was not the ultimate product. We could not do our ultimate product without working with the cloud companies. So that's the time when I wrote my first business plan and moved to Silicon Valley with, the, you know, it was only me and Jacob and, and, and the rest of the people were, were back in Sweden. And now we have our 270 man team. Wow. And majority of them are actually in Silicon Valley and in, in Seattle, in Seattle because of Microsoft and Amazon. So we had to sort of double down on these two <laughs> places. Do you, you see, you've been traveling lately. Is it kind of like, how's that? Is it kind of normalizing traveling internationally? No, it's really a, and very different. Pain in the ass. Very different to be in an airport with very little people. And you sit in a plane and they have, they have every second seat is, is you know, because of the social distance. So you, you've got more space. Uh, but you walk in these empty terminals. Uh, it's an absurd situation. I mean, the world is is challenged, uh, but I, we are more than ever dependent on the internet. And I feel that the work that we are doing at Ubico, but also with the standards, driving security protection for these billions of remote workers and things that we, are, I mean, the only thing standing right now is the internet. I mean, everything is sort of, I wouldn't say, yeah. a lot of things are very disruptive and, and, and not working as well. Uh, but the internet is is tying us all together. And if we can continue to help being part of that important, you know, critical infrastructure, you know, not only with, with YubiKeys, but dr- continue to drive the standards. There is an initiative we we are looking at, and I think is the note of the next discussion. You know, how do you tie a YubiKey to a, a, your real identity? Not just, hey, I'm the same guy coming again. This is my computer. This is, you know. How do we solve voting, Stina? How do exactly. we solve voting? Can you, can you help <laughs> me? We need to, this is the one problem. If we can solve this, we, literally everything can change. If, if every person had a voice and that can actually be tied to that person, you'd see a whole different world that we'd be in. Today. I, I, we are working on that. And I think that's the next sort of cool thing that we can do. Uh, And also, I mean, you are in the cryptocurrency space. You know, how can we combine the best of blockchain that actually was designed? And the whole vision behind blockchain is very similar to Fido and WebAuth and YubiKeys. It's, you know, how do we give um, trust? How do we distribute trust? So we're not depending on the traditional legacy, uh, you know, big one guy, one, you know, trust model. (laughs) But how can we distribute so more people can do things with each other in a trusted way? And I'll say this with crypto, (laughs) with crypto, if you're looking for the answer with with crypto and with Bitcoin, there are still inefficiencies and choke points that provide a little bit too much centralization that I'm comfortable with. Now, it's constantly evolving and changing, but if you can go out and build infrastructure and products and hardware that push for further decentralization of crypto, you will have an extremely successful product. Yes. And I think the overall, I mean, decentralization of security and, and decentralization of trust is a and identity. Like, I think that you're right. I mean, the if we can solve that, I I hope Ubico can be part of, of solving it. We will not be able to do that alone because you, you, you need to tie that to some kind of other identity service. But where I believe the YubiKey and the WebAuthn standard could be tied. And I also believe that there could be synergies between cryptocurrency and WebAuthn mm-hmm. because the cool thing with WebAuthn is that it's built now into directly into platforms and browsers. And that's a very powerful platform. As when, when you get that, it's so much easier. People don't have to download uh, drivers, client software. They don't have to, you know, it just works. <laughs> so so when, when, yeah. when Mt. Gox uh, Bitcoin exchange launched uh, like almost 10 years ago, there no one had been using two-factor authentic. I didn't even n- use it myself for anything. Um, and then, then, then uh, the CEO of Mt. Gox emailed like every, all the users and said, hey, you guys should buy these YubiKeys. And then he actually created Mt. Gox branded YubiKeys. Um, did you know at the time that 
what this Bitcoin thing was in 2011? Did you, you were the CEO, but were you like, did, did it like make it to your desk? What was going on with this Mt. Gox Bitcoin world that all these Bitcoin people were, were using these YubiKeys all of a sudden? Did that, did you hear about that back then? They, they approached us because they actually had a uh, some kind of security issue they needed to solve very quickly. a lot of freaking security issues. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we were like, you know what, they see limb legitimate and we shipped in keys. And they, yes, they also bought keys that they, they, they co-branded. We've done I that. I still we have one. Them. Yeah. So I still have and, one. It's a, and it's honestly, a... I was like, this seems new and, and interesting. And, uh, but, you know, as you say, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and, you know, the whole blockchain technology comes with a lot of prop, I would say com- promise. And there's a lot of th- cool things that are being done, in, but it also yeah. has challenges. Just like WebAuth and Fido is not completely baked. It, you know, it, no, everyone, it's not use, working exactly everywhere. The, the last hurdle we had with WebAuth and was actually when Apple made support last December. It was like, Wow, you know, like because it, it, we've been waiting for that, and before that, the YubiKeys never really. I just worked. saw that. Yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't didn't really work with iPhones, and we we couldn't control it. So I think it, you know, whatever. I'm sure that there will come out something really cool because there's so much innovation and financial resources in the blockchain technology. But I'm not sure, you know, it's going to be exactly what we're seeing today in five or ten years. It's just going to continue to evolve. Yeah. You and your husband have been driven by this company for for over like it's almost like twelve years now or thirteen. I don't know how long. Yes, thirteen their years. Been. We started in 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 spring two thousand seven, and I couldn't get us. I couldn't actually have a salary, and I couldn't even employ my first, my husband the first year. It was only wow. me. Wow. <laughs> so now, like that has driven you guys for so many years, and you've cemented uh, your legacies. You cemented the company's legacies in the history books of the internet. That's that's a that's a given. So now what? Like, how do you go from there? What what keeps driving you? What goal are you setting for yourself uh, like to wake up in the morning in order to succeed? That is a valid question, because I think we have actually succeeded on, you know, a big part of what was the the mission. Uh, Now I'm super proud to. You know, just continue to educate. Talking with you is important. You know, get this out, not just say, hey, we we, we helped to create a, you know, a standard. And of course, we had, you know, the, the help we got from Google and Microsoft, they were actually, the, I would say, the leading contributors together with us on making these standards happen. It was, you know, it, it, so it's important to say, hey, it wasn't just us. It was, it was a co, you know, it was a, project we did together and yeah. then the input from from a lot of other companies uh so i would That's say I like yes. that term pioneer because pioneering implies yeah. like you were the first in a forest cutting the trees but there were still a lot of a bigger people behind you and with you so yeah. pi- you know it's a great it's a great term i think so um, pioneer is but yes um, but now we can need to continue to educate and I, that's why I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. You know, I'm going to talk to your, and to your le- listeners. If you need good security, ask your, don't only get a security key, uh, but ask your your bank, ask your government service to make support for FIDO Web Authent. So it's going to be everywhere. You know, without this sort of the, the education we need to do. And then we will continue to help innovate and, you know, continue to solve <laughs> problems. I am excited about the, you know, the identity part. How can you do trusted identities that are, um, you know, where you people, can, me. people can also have good privacy. Uh, and I think about this all the time. The biggest problem with the biggest, I, I really war game in my head, not war game, but I stre- like, I think about how would you do voting? Yes. But the problem is it requires a centralized authority to not just maintain the digital identity, phys- physical identity, like bridge, but also the approval process. So who is, who is basically responsible for saying, okay, Charlie, we've, accepted your identity. Now this is you. So now when the voting time time comes, is it the like election commission? And now should that be ver- publicly verifiable? Can you? So it, there's a lot of questions that if they're not figured out, then the whole reason to do it is almost moot. Um, but I think it's the goal. I think I really think that if, if someone can figure out and countries adopt to be able to do democracy on a blockchain, would I? World peace. World peace would literally happen. You, it would be the end of 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 mm-hmm. so many 
inequality and issues. I'm telling you, you'd give an equal voice to everyone. You'd give an equal voice that cannot be put down. It's I agree. So important. Yeah, I agree. I um, mean, we that the equal voice and giving people a voice, especially in these times, I am very concerned what we're seeing for non-democratic countries right now, how they are misusing uh, the epidemic to quiet people and put in more restrictions. Uh, we at Ubico, we are working on trying to for, for solve the, you know, how we combine this with a privacy preserving identity. We did put in privacy preserving features into the FIDO web auth and spec. You can use the same key across any number of services without the services tracking or any information. It's not like Google sit on everything or Microsoft or Facebook. They don't know that the same key is used across all these. Um, then you just, we need to figure out how you tie that to your real identity, to your driver license. And we are, uh, we are actually working on a project with, um, uh, with a, it, it's in, in the early state, but we are working with a project trying to figure that out. I'm happy to be on the podcast a year from now and yeah, we'll please. hear more information about it. But wanna... my last, my last thing that I really will, just want to emphasize, yeah. we also are working with a uh, organization that protect the free open internet and free speech, because if there is no free speech, there is no security. So after I realized I want to help to protect the internet because it's such an important critical infrastructure for democracy and, and, you know, world peace or whatever. I mean, everything we do on the internet, you know, the whole invention behind internet is, is the, the best in mankind, but yeah. I'm realizing that all the efforts we put into a secure internet, it has really very little impact if we don't have free speech. If there is no free speech, there is no security. I can, That's just I, reality. You said that so <laughs> perfectly. And, and on that note, I, free speech is the most is one of the most important liberties and freedoms in our world today. Uh, I'm a I'm a voluntarist, so I believe the world is a voluntary place. But that's another conversation. But to, so to take a step further, you have people who believe in free speech, but don't believe in 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 the right to privacy. I believe privacy is a basic human right. I'm a very very firm Absolutely. believer in that. No. So what do you can, say to people? No, yeah, you have to have historically his, his security and privacy has not been necessarily tied, um, but we need to continue to have that in the physical world. We have privacy when we, you know, we can get a vault in a bank and no one is going to look in our vault. You know, we have privacy in that vault. No one is going to open up and see what we've hide in that vault. So why? Why aren't we allowed to have privacy in the digital world? <laughs> you, you tell me that answer. That was going to be my question. Why is it OK? To basically tell, oh, sorry, it's in my vault. It's private. I don't want to show you. But if someone comes wants to see a digital transaction, it's yeah. like if you don't want to give someone that, it's like, what are you hiding? Why is yeah. that a double standard? You talk about standards. Let's talk about double yeah. standards to end off the show. What's going on here? I think, unfortunately, we are in a time where there are a lot of both government and um, big companies are seeing the the benefit of tracking people and, and mm. collecting data. Data is, is the new gold. <laughs> data is the new gold. <laughs> and, and we are all giving it away with all these free services. And we love the free services. We all love Google and Facebook. We love and the free are, services. You know, and then we, we, we give away our privacy. Um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of non-democratic countries and maybe not you know, even countries who, who we believe are democratic are also misusing that data. And so it is one of the most important challenges for us as a mankind to figure out. And uh, but I think there is enough people who care. And Corona has highlighted a lot of the things that aren't really working in the Western society and in the, you know, in the global uh, as a whole. Uh, I'm always looking for the silver lining and I'm think that this during this crisis, there are things that initially it will look like, oh, this is going in the wrong direction. But I'm on very I'm very optimistic about a lot of people finally. Like, yeah, I, think, I, I think you're right. Like, hey, we want to solve this. We're not going to just sit down and you know, sit here and, and let bad things happen. We, you know, it's we, the people that are quiet that are the ones building things. So I know people get like disheartened when they're seeing the news and all the you know, it's like. But there are people working on solutions and building. They're just being quiet about it because they're busy building. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, who has better food, California or Sweden? California, no doubt. Really? <laughs> but I, I, would, like I was going to say Sweden. Meatballs. The Swedish meatballs with the lingonberry jams are actually quite good. 
<laughs> maybe because maybe because in California you still have that farm to tableness. I know, like in Sweden and a lot of places in Europe, where anything you've you anything you're eating is coming from within a day's drive. Where Florida, like where I am too, I have to go out of my way to do that to get good quality food. The rest of the country, it's it's impossible to afford good quality food. That's why fast food and obesity, because good quality food is so expensive. Like this bag of freaking vegan granola is fifteen dollars. Why is a bag of granola fifteen vegan granola fifteen? It's me. But I love Swedish food, and I love how Sweden. I love how I love all of Scandinavian food. I spent like two summers in Norway. A few, uh, few years ago when I first got into Bitcoin um, and I was freaked out about how the sun never sets in the summer. It's it crazy. Is, it yeah, is it's so awesome. cool. Yeah, it is. And it's coming up now, not this Friday. It's the it's the day of the year where the sun doesn't set. It just touches the horizon and then, you know, it lifts again. And all Swedes are very friendly and open. And there's a there's actually a statistic. There's more babies down that day. <laughs> so, oh, my God. A lot of a lot of children are born in March, you know, nine months later. Because Thank you so much for coming happy. on the show today. I really appreciate it and have a great day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Talk Bye-bye. to you later.